Good evening. We have a short subject to start off this evening, which is three six. I don't know that you don't have numbers on your program, as I recall. This is under the general topic of understanding death and the hereafter. And last week we considered particularly loss of loved ones, the attitude that we should have towards the loss of loved ones. A free a few um, Extracts here dealing with predestined and accidental death and the question of fate. And then a series of quotations which are here related really to the question of the spirit of faith and the spirit of immortality in this world in the sense of what perceptions of the spiritual world are accessible to man while he's still dwelling here. Fascinating subject. We get on a little later to what's the perception in the other world, although we don't understand that. This one is interesting to understand, too. And the first extract is from some answered questions, and it deals with this question. Is the predestination which is mentioned in the holy books a decreed thing? If so, is not the effort to avoid it useless? The answer. Fate is of two kinds. One is decreed and the other is conditional or impending. The decreed fate is that which cannot change or be altered, and conditional fate is that which may occur. So for this lamp, Abdullah obviously had a lamp at the table in Akka, you've seen the room in the house of Abdullah Pasha where these talks were originally given. So for this lamp, the decreed fate is that oil burns and will be consumed. Therefore, its eventual extinction is a decree which it is impossible to alter or to change because it is a decreed fate. The lamp has so much oil in it, if it keeps burning, the oil is going to burn out and the lamp is going to go out. In the same way, in the body of man, a power of life has been created. And as soon as it is destroyed and ended, the body will certainly be decomposed. So when the oil in this lamp is burnt and finished, the lamp will undoubtedly become extinguished. This is decreed fate, now conditional fate. He says, but conditional fate may be likened to this. While there is still oil, a violent wind blows on the lamp, which extinguishes it. This is conditional fate. It is wise to avoid it, to protect oneself from it, to be cautious and circumspect. But the decreed fate, which is like the finishing of the oil in the lamp, cannot be altered, changed, nor delayed must happen, it is inevitable that the lamp will become extinguished. So if we project this understanding onto the matter of time of death, we see that there are these two possibilities. Now, oftentimes it's quite impossible to scrutinize whether the oil has actually run out or not. Because perhaps the oil is not and measured by intended to cause you to reach a very old age. We don't know. We don't know what the purpose of God is. Abdu'l-Bahá comments on this in a tablet as well. This is in selections from the writings of Abdu'l-Bahá. Thou hadst asked about fate, predestination, and will. This is on page 198. You're going to want to read this again. It's very heavy going. But very uh, important tablet. Fate and predestination consist in the necessary and indispensable relationships which exist in the realities of things. These relationships have been placed in the realities of existent beings through the power of creation. And every incident is a consequence of the necessary relationship. 
For example, God has created a relation between the sun and the terrestrial globe, that the rays of the sun should shine and that the soil should yield. These relationships constitute predestination and the manifestation thereof in the plane of existence is fate. Will is that active force which controlleth these relationships and these incidents. Such is the epitome of the explanation of fate and predestination. I have no time for a detailed explanation. Ponder over this, the reality of fate, predestination, and will shall be made manifest. So you have the key here anyway. Now, this references here, these references here to fate, to predestination, and to will relate to a scheme of creation that was explained and elaborated on by the Bab. It also appears in fragmentary form in the teachings of the Imams of Shia Islam. And that is that all things that come into being come into being through, through seven contingent stages of progression. The first all-encompassing stage of divine reality is in itself the what we know as the world of command. That's this middle line that you have on your ring, ringstone symbol. You have three worlds of existence there, the world of God, the world of the true one, the world of command, or the world that would be the world of the divine command or will. And then the third, which is the world of creation, or the world of servitude, the condition of servitude. Now, I understand that this is called the world of command because of this uh, phrase in the Quran and repeated in the Baha'i teachings that God said, be, and it is that God has called all creation into existence through his commanding word, be, and it is. This is the combination of be and e that we hear, we see in the obligatory prayers and other, other tablets. Now, this be and this e in Persian are the letters k and n, which combined make the command word kon. Now, sometimes you hear the Persian mothers speaking to their children, they say, nakon, nakon, don't do that, don't do that. The same simple, ordinary word. But kon, in this, as a commanding word that calls all existence into creation and maintains, because it's a commanding word that's, that's not a command in time, but it's a command that takes place, as I understand, perennially. It continues by his command, all things exist, and they continue to exist because his command continues to to uh, maintain creation. It's not just, again, it's not something that he's made and set out there by itself. He's, it's something that he's breathing life into. So this all-encompassing reality, this central reality, which the Bab identifies with the inner nature of the manifestation of God, he has that to operate with. We have our souls. We have the spirit that God's breathed into us. The manifestation has that. And then he has this additional dimension, which is the dimension of the Holy Spirit, which is the reflection or power of that whole all-encompassing divine realm, which is the intermediary between the absolute and the relative. And with that, he's endowed to instill in creation the uh, favors, the splendors, the energies of the divine qualities and names that constitute the essence of God. And he impregnates the whole of creation with these. Now, this primal will is identified as the letter B of that command. And the next stage in the progression of these seven stages is connected with the letter E. And it's usually referred to in the writings as divine purpose. Who by his will and his purpose hath affected creation or whatever you you find it in different ways, in different combinations. These, are, these for the Persian friends here, these are the stages of Mashiat and Erade. The Bab is connected Mashiat with Kof and Erade with Nun. And he said, through the combination of these two universal power, powerful realities, 
all other things have arisen into existence. Beyond that comes a stage called fate, and beyond that a stage called predestination. And then there's fixed time, and there's various contingent stages, until the last of the seven stages is called the book. And it means the manifest book of the cosmos, the manifest book of existence. But also part of that book are these invisible spiritual realms where the souls reside after living in this world, where they go after death, or where they, they see after death, if you will, because it's all here together. It's not separated in that sense. We think of it as off somewhere, but it's really right here. In fact, our souls are part of that world and not part of this world. They're connected and see in this world because we have a body and we're living here. But as soon as the oil of this body is finished, then the soul begins seeing in another level of existence. So he talks about these stages and they're coming into being. And this is what Abdul Baha, I think, is referring to where he says that these are constitute the necessary and indispensable relationships which exist, which weave together creation. Now, Abdul Baha in one tablet mentions that there are two books. There is this manifest book of existence, the open tablet of creation. He sometimes, you see in the translations, it's mentioned in different ways. If you watch for it, you'll see it here and there. And he says that um, in another place, that all created things are as letters and words. They're all part of a vocabulary of divine creation. They constitute the signs of God, the ayat, the same as the signs of God revealed in the revealed book. So you have the manifest book, the book of creation, and you have the book of revelation. Two books coming from the same source. God through the manifestation is the revealer of creation as well as the revealer of revelation. And Abdul Baha says these two books coincide perfectly one with another. And by reading and studying either of them, you will come to understand the mysteries and meanings of the other book. So by the study of science and the observation of creation, your wonder and appreciation of the revealed book will increase. And by the study of the book of Revelation, your uh, marvel at the wonders of creation will also increase. And this is why we have this twofold um, education where we're to study all the arts and sciences on the one hand and, and also we're to uh, immerse ourselves in the ocean of the divine verses of revelation. It's the combination of this brings man to creation, brings the human reality to um, perfection. Now, These stages obviously are invisible, except for what we know of them in our own selves. We don't really need to follow them, except for the purpose of understanding particularly fate and predestination, and realizing that everything is in the hands of God, and that spirit does not arise from matter, but matter arises from spirit. Our civilization, for several centuries, the whole popular point of view is that uh, Spirit is a phenomena that's been produced by the human brain or tales of this nature, which have no basis in reality. Rather, just the opposite, that spirit and consciousness is fundamental and permanent. Matter and um, the uh, configurations of material substance are very ephemeral. They come and they go. People disintegrate, but souls don't disintegrate. That's the permanent thing. So we have to get our vision turned around so that it coincides with the explanations of the master if we're going to penetrate realities, if we're going to understand creation as he intends us to understand it. There, in daily lessons of Mrs. Goodall, she's also asked this question. Let's see if we have any other points here that would throw light on this. The question is, suppose a man is ill and dies, not having summoned a physician. Had his time come to die, or would he, with proper care, have recovered? Answer, there are two kinds of death. One is preordained, and the other is dependent upon many things. For example, a lamp is filled with oil, and it will burn as long as the oil will last. This is preordained. If the lamp is filled with oil to burn five hours, it will not burn six hours. Another lamp may be filled, but a strong wind arising may put out the light. 
This is the other kind of death, dependent upon circumstances. It is certain that if a babe be thrown into the sea, it will die. This is not preordained death, for the child had just begun to live, just begun its life. Question, then these circumstances are somewhat dependent upon the will of God. Yes, said the master, but God has given him that will. Question, can any of these circumstances be changed by prayer? Yes, prayer might prevent the strong wind from blowing out the light of the lamp, but it could never change the amount of oil on the lamp. That is preordained. <laughs> so use this example that he's given, wherever he speaks about this subject, he generally gives this example again. Now there's, there is a, an explanation uh, given to, one of the, uh, to a, uh, a woman in the gleanings, which also talks about this uh, predestination and faith. And you might look that up too. I don't have a copy of it here, but it runs along the same line. And it says that one of these is fixed and one of them is subject to the possibility of changing. Although even there, there, there he describes another degree, which is um, a conditional kind of fate, who have been granted vision by this sublime beauty. Say, verily, the verses of the merciful uplift the stainless hearts unto those pure realms of the Spirit, which cannot be described in words or expressed in symbols. Blessed are they that hearken. Baha'u'llah is here awakening, us, awakening in us a desire to discern these realms. It talks about a few little drops, a few hints to us. Stainless souls have to hearken very closely to these verses, chant them with a melodious voice. At least you could listen to them chanted with a melodious voice if you don't have a melodious voice or if you don't chant. You might uh, intone your own prayers out loud to help you to center and concentrate on the, the uh, fully resonate with these verses as you're reading them so that this helps to center your attention. The Master says that this is one of the wisdoms of reciting prayers out loud is it helps us to concentrate. It helps center the thoughts that otherwise go wandering off other places. In another tablet, Baha'u'llah says, cleanse the eye from unsatisfying views. This is an older translation, but it covers some interesting points. Cleanse the eye from unsatisfying views that thou mayest see the manifestations of the majestic oneness in everything. Purify thine ear from the sayings of all the people, that thou mayest hear the holy and godlike tones from all directions. And sanctify thy heart from the confused worldly illusions of the past, that thou mayest perceive the plain, direct, wonderful words revealed and victoriously succeed to the stream of eternal holiness and the pure wine which has no likeness. This is the command of the ancient beauty to thee. So we have purifying, cleansing the eye, purifying the ear, sanctifying the heart. Freeing oneself from the outer attention of this world. Freeing oneself from the idle sayings of the people of the world, sanctifying oneself from allusions to the past. Now we know in a number of tablets, Paola speaks about this. What are, what are we really doing? You know, when you think about this, it seems to me that some of you may have heard me mention these thoughts before. You forgive me if I repeat them again. There is a... Um, a letter from Shoghi Effendi with reference to the question of can I trust the guidance I receive in my dreams? Someone wrote, said they had some guidance in dreams, they felt impelled to do that, they felt to do this. Is this right or is it wrong? And the general guidance that Shoghi Effendi has given in several letters, but particularly in this one letter, is that one has to be query of guidance given in dreams. It is true that God can guide us in dream, does guide us at times through dream, but 
he says that human consciousness, human character is so uh, liable to warp and distort the flow of that inspiration as to make it suspect. That you would want to compare it very closely with the divine texts and see, if, first of all, if it conformed with, with the, what it says in the writings. And then second, you may want to submit such ideas to the administrative institutions, which he said are the channel through which Baha'u'llah has provided for the guidance of the affairs of the people. You might want to submit it to a group, a consultative group, not an assembly, a group of close friends or acquaintances that you trust to say, I propose this plan of action. How does this strike everybody in the light of the teachings and so on? Be that it is may, as it may, that's one aspect of it. The very interesting side truth that one derives from this particular letter uh, to my way of thinking, is that inspiration is constantly coming to man. It is part of human, of human nature to be sustained by a constant effulgence of divine inspiration, which, because of the character of the soul, the gem of the soul, the mirror of the soul, is not clearly perceived by the heart, by the soul, by the mind. We have acquired certain fixed ways of looking at things. And he says that our opinions and our prejudices, our loves, our likings, our dislikes, our hates, warp and distort that flow of inspiration. We are not cut off from divine inspiration. The guidance flows to us at all times. The power to see with the way that God wants us to see is latent within us. He says that in a tablet, Baha'u'llah himself says in a tablet that's quoted in Eglinus, he says, however, man unaided can never free himself from these darknesses, these veils, these clouds that have a, he, have a, he has acquired in the course of being born and living in this world without the assistance of the divine intermediary. And this is why in every age a stainless soul has been sent into the world, commissioned to cleanse man with the sanctifying breeze of his teachings, to free his heart, to draw him away from attachment to these opinions and prejudices, so that sanctified and cleansed, this mirror of man's inner reality can receive this guidance in its pure form. Now, this doesn't mean that that light in itself is, is sufficient. It is the light by which man's reasoning, divine reasoning, spiritual reasoning, can operate in understanding the verses of God, in acquiring the meanings, in understanding and penetrating the purpose that the verses have. How many of us, because our concept of what religion is, does not allow religion the place it should have in our lives? Because that was not the place that religion had in the lives of our parents, nor the place that religion had in the lives of our school teachers, of our peers, nor perhaps of all of our neighbors and companions at the present moment. But the condition, man's faith, he says, can be conditioned by no one but his own self. So if we don't feel inspired enough or close enough to God, that is a problem not of our community, but of us. You know? Each one of us has to, through the effects of these verses of God in our own being, gradually close one eye to the world and open the other eye to the beauty of God, to the hallowed beauty of the beloved, as he said. And the divine teachings that Baha'u'llah has poured forth are the most effective, most potent means for bringing about this change. So he says, then you will see with my eye and you will hear with my ear. Why? Because all of this individual acquisition, you'll be detached from it. It's there. It's there in consciousness. You can think about it. You can remember the prejudices and opinions. You'll understand them when you see them in other people very clearly. We'll still, we, we, we see the problem in the people. And we pray and we try to bridge them across these limitations that they have, you know. 
I like the Baha'i teachings very much, but I can't stand white people. What shall I do? See, <laughs> this is my problem. I can't come to the meetings because of that. Or I would like to be a Baha'i, but I can't follow Persian, and everybody in the feast speaks Persian, you know, or some situation of this sort. There are strange things that keep people back from the faith at the very beginning that we have to help to free themselves from, from these ideas and these thoughts. Now, how much more our own selves? We're right in the middle. We've plunged into the cause. We've plunged into the service of the cause. Here you are offering a part of your life, full-time part of your life, to the service of the faith. You want to get the most out of it. Not only so that you will get the most out of it, but so the cause will get the most out of it. Because the more we acquire spiritual insight, the more we acquire divine attributes, the better we'll get along with each other and the better the service of the cause will be. And the more the cause will progress. After all, the cause is, in this sense, in this world, at this time, the appearance of its powers within human souls. It doesn't reside in buildings or in shrines as physical things, but in the response that the souls that follow the manifestations of the Bab and Baha'u'llah, what they demonstrate, what they manifest. How can we draw nearer to the other world? How can we lift these veils? by turning to his teachings, by imploring his assistance, by pondering and wondering over his instructions and guidance. He talks about human reason unveiling mysteries that have to do with this life. The rational souls, even those of human beings who do not recognize God or pay any attention to religion, they are able to uncover scientific truths. But this power is also one that proceeds from the Holy Spirit, Abdu'l-Bah says, if we're not for the influence of that spirit of the world of command, even the power of thinking would not be given to man. But sometimes still he's in a condition where he doesn't recognize the source of this and how it works. But he says there's this other spirit, the divine spirit, the Holy Spirit, that is the, the, the power of divine intellect, the power of divine mind that's operating in the manifestations of God which, when breathed into the soul, the rational soul, endows it with another way of seeing and knowing. Abdul Baha says that the spirit of faith is the Holy Spirit breathed into the spirit of man. It creates a new condition in us. But we are the ones that constantly have to renew that spirit by going back to the fountain of blessings and grace, which is prayer, which is reading of the divine verses morning and evening. Here it is, visiting, of course, the shrines, pouring out our lives in service. All these things renew and keep us alert so that the mirror of our beings doesn't cloud over any more than it is, that it keeps getting better, that we progress spiritually each day. Spiritually, then, in that sense, is removing veils, removing prejudices, removing opinions, and clothing ourselves ever more in the truths and realities, spiritual truths and realities which are at the center of the cause, embodying the light of God in our daily patterns of existence, in our relationships one with another. This is spiritual progress, okay? The divine spirit, the master says, however, doth unveil divine realities and universal mysteries which lie within the spiritual world. It is my hope that thou wilt attain unto this divine spirit so that thou mayest uncover the secrets of the other world as well as the mysteries of the world below. Again, he says, but the sight of the heart speaks about the outer vision and the inner vision, but the sight of the heart is illumined. It discerneth and discovereth the divine kingdom. It is everlasting and eternal. Praise God, therefore, that the sight of the heart is illumined and the hearing of thy mind, the sight of thy heart is illumined and the hearing of thy mind responsive. And to the degree that we feel this in ourselves, praise God. 
thank God. Because it's out of the gladness of his heart. He says, rejoice in the gladness of thine heart that thou mayest be worthy to see me. Just the feelings that we have, the interest that we have in these teachings. Thank God we have it. This is the start. This is the beginning. This is the movement towards him. And if we're happy in it, if we're pleased in it, then he, he is, in that sense, he reveals himself more to us. Because that very gladness over spiritual progress again removes more veils and moves us closer, warms us, so to speak. It's like the, the um, iron again, you know. You want the iron in the fire. You move the iron of your being towards the fire of the love of God. And gradually it acquires the heat. If you pull it out again, it cools off again. So we want divine closeness. We move towards the teachings. We move towards prayer. We move towards living the Baha'i life. And the heat gradually takes on all of the hardness and the darkness and the coldness of that iron and transforms it into something luminous, incandescent, liquid in character. It takes on all the qualities of the fire itself. So you don't know that it was iron. Unless you take it out again, it turns to iron <laughs> quickly enough. Praise be to him. Thy dear husband hath perceived the sweet scents or fragrances that blow from the gardens of heaven. So we have this image that there's certain sweetnesses, certain fragrances that waft in the, in the meadows of the soul, if you will, in the inner consciousness of man from time to time, and stir us and fill us with the sweetness of the other worlds. Forsake thou every other concern. Let oblivion overtake the memory of all else. Confine thy thoughts to whatever will lift up the human soul to the paradise of heavenly grace and make every bird of the kingdom wing its way under the supreme horizon, the central point of everlasting honor in this contingent world. Abdul Baha, Selections from the Writings of Abdul Baha, page 178. Likewise, ask thou of God that the magnet of his love should draw unto thee the knowledge of him. Have you asked God that? Ask thou of God that the magnet of his love should draw unto thee the knowledge of him. Once a soul becometh holy in all things, purified, sanctified, the gates of the knowledge of God will open wide before his eyes. Promise. Abdu Baha, you promised. <laughs> Here I am with my prayer book. Although the kingdom of heaven is hidden from the sight of this unwitting people, still to him who seeth with the inner eye, it is plain as day. Wherefore dwell thou ever in the kingdom, and be thou oblivious of this world below. Be thou so wholly absorbed in the emanations of the Spirit <clears throat> that nothing in the world of man will distract thee. Not even problems in your department. <laughs> One of the Christian saints was that wrote some centuries back when Christian saints were very saintly. <laughs> he uh, describes how his devotions and his prayers, he became so attached to God that this warmth would penetrate his being and then he could move into other affairs and carry that with him. And people said, well, how can you do anything, you know, if you're in a state, if you're just all filled up with these lofty thoughts and so on, you're surely going to not be able to do the ordinary affairs of the day. And he said, no, he said that the effects of the Holy Spirit in the soul are such that one computes and does all the various things that they have to do with more skill than if one just relied on one's own state of being to do it. I mean, you know, well, prayer here, and this is work now. <laughs> okay, prayer here, and I get prepared, and then I come, and with that spirit, I do the work. Then the work gets done. And it gets done in a way that doesn't cause me spiritual damage. It's an inch, it's the whole concept. 
uh, in South America we used to say to the the friends to understand this that you have two ways to pod peas. You know, if you're sitting potting peas, you can either sit in the shade or you can sit in the sun. <laughs> Again, this is still Tablets of the Master. He says, O servant of Baha, be self-sacrificing in the path of God and wing thy flight unto the heavens of the love of the Abha beauty. For any movement animated by love moveth from the periphery to the center, from space to the day star of the universe. Perchance thou deemest this to be difficult, but I tell thee that such cannot be the case. For when the motivating and guiding power is the divine force of magnetism, it is possible by its aid to traverse time and space easily and swiftly. Glory be upon the people of Baha. Selections from the writings of Abdu'l-Baha, page 197. Marvelous quotation. All right, how are we going to get there? You know, if we want to create our own jet power and go, we don't go anywhere. We just don't go anywhere. But if we allow him to attract us, to draw us, if we don't hold to the ground, if we don't tie our feet to the trees and everything at this level of being, we free ourselves from all these attachments. We become detached. Then we rise. Because his power attracts everything that's detached. The difference, the kingdom is here, the earth world is here. If you move away from the world, you move towards the kingdom. If you move towards the kingdom, you move away from the world. What is the kingdom? What, is, what, do, what, do, what do we understand by the kingdom? We're constantly talking about the kingdom. What is this kingdom? Mm. Harriet? Well, I think... <laughs> <laughs> I think it must relate to those seven stages, somewhere between the divine essence and, well, mm -hmm. here we are. Here we are. What do we know by the word kingdom itself? Wait. I think it means being close to the king. Yes, being close to the king. This is the one thing we know about a kingdom is that it should have a king. <laughs> and the kingdom of Abha, the Abha kingdom, the kingdom of Baha'u'llah must be that place or that state or that condition where the will of Baha'u'llah rules. Hmm? This would be presumed because the kingdom is under the sovereignty of a ruler. If you want to be a faithful citizen in a kingdom, well, you have to obey the laws of the king. Then you're under his protection. If you break those laws, then you're under his wrath. Or maybe you'll get expelled from the kingdom. You want to get in the kingdom now in the first place, even we have to immigrate, you know, we're not we're not even just automatically there, although by having accepted Baha'u'llah as the manifestation of God, in a sense you've endorsed his right to rule over you. Acceptance of a manifestation of God, you have recognized that he has the power to ordain the way your life should be. Now having engaged him as your king. Does it behoove you to disobey the rules of the king? We want to find out what is his law. We want to draw close to his court. We would like to be close enough to see him from time to time. Consort with him. Maybe even get to talk to him sometime. Not that we'd have a whole lot to say, but <laughs> I'm sure he has a lot to say. <laughs> How can we draw close to Baha'u'llah? And you know when Abdu'l Baha speaks about this, sometimes, sometimes he speaks about God in general, but oftentimes he'll come back and he'll just make it clear to us. Since there's no access to the essence of God in, in, in the way that we'd like that closeness, he said the closeness is with Baha'u'llah. Turn all your thoughts, concentrate your love and your attention on Baha'u'llah. But this is not Baha'u'llah as a person, so to speak, although it's centered in a person and there's some place where he is in the sense that we can relate to him. But this power of this other inner state of the manifestations that pours forth from him, the breath of the kingdom, the power of the kingdom. 
And if we can come under that rule, we are under it anyway, but if we can become conscious that we're under that rule, we can draw the benefits of being faithful citizens of such a realm, endows us with new sight, new ears. We live in new places and perceive new scenes, wondrous visions. Mm-hmm. Likeness being nearness. I think you've given two answers, both are correct. Because, again, what's latent in the reality of man is the trust of God. And he tells us that is the image and likeness of the names and attributes of God. In other words, man is a mirror which can reflect into creation these names and qualities of God. So, in one sense, drawing close to Baha'u'llah is, is nearness to him, likeness, is that he who is most like or manifests more clearly these divine names in his own being is obviously closer to those divine names. And the center of those divine names is Baha'u'llah. So you're centered, you're closer to Baha'u'llah as a result. You know, the closer you are to the spirit of the faith and the spirit of the teachings, the closer you are to Baha'u'llah. Said, I don't know, this is the way I understand it, but I think you've said both these things. You know, it's not one or the other. It seems to be both. Again, it's not so much that we should somehow find in ourselves a way to be loving and wise, but rather that we should detach ourselves from our affection to things that are unworthy of us so that the love of God operates us in such a way that we will be expressive of the name of God, the loving, and we will be the reflection in some ways in our acts and in our words and in our deeds of God the wise. It isn't that we have to learn how to do what he does or learn how to be the way he is and imitate or practice it, but that we should come away from our own limited conditions so that more of those divine names that he's set in motion in our being can begin to operate through us. And then we're like witnesses to his power. You know, this is, I bear witness that thou hast created me to know thee and worship thee. And this same worship is this appearance of his favors in human reality. Does that help? I don't know. <laughs> Does anyone want to comment on this question or ask something else? Well, this is lovely now. This, these are steps, we you know, we're, we're walking up a stairway. I like to think of it as a crystal staircase. The light is getting brighter each step we take. Now, here's another step. Those souls that in this day enter the divine kingdom and attain everlasting life. Now, we understand from everything else we've read that the soul that recognizes the cause and takes the step to enter the faith, in a sense, has entered the divine kingdom. Attaining the everlasting life is the quality of receiving the spirit of faith through the divine teachings so that we're inspired with faith. We have faith. We have hope. We have vision. Whatever the grade and degree of it is, we have it because we're Baha'is. He says, those souls that in this day enter the divine kingdom and attain everlasting life, though, although materially dwelling on earth, yet in reality soar in the realm of heaven. Their bodies may linger on earth, but their spirits travel in the immensity of space. For as thoughts widen and become illumined, they acquire the power of flight and transport man to the kingdom of God. Page 202, Selections from the Writings of Abdu'l Baha. You take these two or three quotations and write them in your prayer books if you want, or on a piece of paper. Read them over and over. Think about what is, what is he telling us here? It's the secret of True escapism, <laughs> the right kind. Adi warns us, he says, Know thou verily there are many veils in which the truth is enveloped, gloomy veils, then delicate and transparent veils, then the envelopment of light, the sight of which dazzles the eyes, still veil. That's from the Tablets of Abdu'l Baha, volume 1, page 71. Here's another step. This world resembles 
the human body. And the kingdom of God is like the spirit of life. So we have a human body and we have the spirit of life that animates that body. Then we have the world and we have the kingdom of God, which animates the world. If you think back just for a moment, uh, in the Bible, you have actually the term kingdom used as synonymous with the manifestation. He says the kingdom of God is a seed sower. And he casts the seeds and some fall on rocks and some fall on fertile ground. See, he, it, the kingdom of God becomes a he. Really, the kingdom of God is Baha'u'llah in every sense. Is or is the manifestation of God of the age in which each of us, each of the peoples in the past have lived. This world resembles the human body and the kingdom of God is like the spirit of life. Think how narrow and dark the material world of man is. How afflicted with disease and maladies. But how bright and spacious is is his spiritual world. Through this illustration, thou mayest comprehend in what manner is the spiritual world portrayed in this earthly world, and in what degrees is its power affected. Though the spirit is concealed, its power is manifested and clear in the phenomenal world. So is the kingdom of God. Though it is veiled from the eyes of ignorant people, to men of perception, it is discernible and evident. Therefore, thou must become entirely heavenly, that thou mayest forget the earthly conditions and be immersed in the perception of divinity to such a degree that thou wilt be unconscious of the surrounding material existence. Still living in it and acting and serving in it, but not dependent upon your joys and your feelings about what's happening in it. You see, you think now, we see the growing effects of the Son of Truth in this century. Remember, Abdu'l-Bah says this doesn't happen all at once. That the rising of the Son of Truth has to be gradual. He's dawn from the horizon of the world, he's passed to the other world, and now the spirit and energies of Baha'u'llah are rising, gradually they will rise to the zenith in this dispensation, to the zenith of the expression of the influence of the power of the kingdom of God in human souls. And that consummation is the beginning of divine civilization, some extraordinary new phase in human development that we can't even foresee what it's going to be now. Because there will be this interaction Souls who are influenced by the Spirit of God have an influence on each other. And this composite or compounded influence of many souls turning to spiritual light will create an entirely new condition in all of us, is the impression that one has. The human kingdom will become suffused with the power of the kingdom of God so that the uh, organism of the body when it's animated by the spirit of faith and so on it becomes healthy it becomes radiant so the whole body of the world will likewise become luminous with the radiance of the Apa kingdom from pole to pole he tells us in one of his tablets will shine with know thou that the true one possesseth invisible worlds which human meditation is unable to comprehend and the intellect of man hath no power to imagine. When thou wilt purify and clarify thy spiritual nostrils from every worldly moisture, then thou wilt inhale the holy fragrances diffusing from the merciful gardens of these worlds. The beautiful promise. This is the third volume of Tablets, page 645. Again, we're, we're coming, we're, we're weaving a pattern back and forth over the same theme. With these tablets of the Master, he's created, creating a fabric. When man's soul is, rare, is rarefied and cleansed, again, this detachment, this whole process, spiritual links are set up, and from these bonds, heartfelt sensations are produced. The human heart resembles a mirror. When this is purified, hearts are attuned and reflect one another 
and thus spiritual emotions spring up. This is like under the world of dreams when man is detached from tangible matter and experiences spiritual activities. What amazing laws operate and what remarkable discoveries are made and it may even be that detailed communications are registered. Know thou verily God has preferred the insight to the sight, because the sight sees the material things, while the insight apprehends the spiritual. The former witnesses this earthly world, while the latter sees the world of the kingdom. The former's judgment is temporary, while the latter's vision is everlasting. This is in relation to a soul that's passed away. It says, usher her, part of a prayer, usher her into the heaven of thy meeting and suffer her to live everlastingly in the assemblage of transfiguration whose refulgent lights are shining upon the world of hearts and the realm of consciousness. In a tablet, Abdu'l-Baha says, the mediums, however, are speaking of the world of thought and not of reality. But a heavenly soul who is conscious of the divine world, whose discerning eye is open, who is detached from the world of nature and has attained to spiritual power, is cognizant of the divine realm, divine world, and those of the spirits. Reality is pure spirit. It is not physical. That is, it does not occupy space. Uh, we'll have some more tablets on this later on about this question of spiritual communications and so on. But Abdu'l-Bahá says those that think they hear rappings and tappings and trumpets and all these things in different ways, he says they are, uh, they are, uh, they may be even sincere in this, but they're hearing them in their own through their own thoughts and imaginations. They develop the messages that they hear from the dead themselves and not really from the dead. This is different from the spiritual upliftment that the heart feels, the joy, the exhilaration that comes through meditation on the divine verses, the feeling of closeness to God. It's not communicated in outer words, but something that flows naturally from the words of God into the heart when the heart is in the right spirit of receptivity. And in that state, it is possible also to draw close to loved ones that are on the other side. Again, not that they should speak to us and tell us what company to invest in or <laughs> who we should marry or such things as this, but that we should commune with them in the common joy that we feel in the presence of the beloved. So that we're pulse when we're pulsing with that, we turn spontaneously to our dear loved ones we remember them, we think about them, and our love for them is increased, and their love for us is increased. And this interaction that's taking place uplifts and fills our hearts. And in that sense, we can draw close to the other world. That doesn't mean that sometimes in dreams we don't see our loved ones also coming to us, especially if people who are concerned. There, we saw, we read a couple of weeks ago about people who were very worried about their loved ones, and then they would have a dream and they would say that I'm fine and not to worry about me. Uh, I remember a lady saying that she had a, a sympathizer, a seeker in, somewhere out in Oregon that she'd been teaching the cause to, and she was drawing quite close to the faith, and then she passed away before she'd become a Baha'i, and this teacher was really concerned about her, you know, so she prayed and prayed for her. Well, if only she'd accepted the faith before she died and so on. And she said, after some weeks, I had a dream of this lady. And she said, not to worry about me. She said, I saw her all dressed in white. She said, not to worry about me. I'm fine. She said, they're treating me. Everyone's treating me so, so lovingly. And it's everything is wonderful here. And uh, my life is filled with happiness. Not to worry at all. And she says, you know, on certain days, on certain occasions, your Baha'u'llah arises on the horizon and fills our whole place with light. 
I don't know if that was the holy days or what that was going on. <laughs> uh, whatever the truth of such a thing is, it still it has its it has its appeal as a story. And this is confirmed in a number of letters later on too, where uh, where the master says that if they haven't accepted here, they still have a chance to embrace the light on the other on the other side if they haven't turned away from the light. In another tablet, he says, in like manner for man to comprehend the divine essence and the nature of the great hereafter is in no wise possible. The merciful outpourings of that divine essence, however, are vouchsafed unto all beings. And it is incumbent upon man to ponder in his heart upon the effusions of the divine grace, the soul being counted as one of these effusions, in other words rather than upon the divine essence. This is the utmost limit for human understanding. Now, this is this tajaliyat, this is this divine effulgence. This is the divine, what has been ordained as the divine presence, is the perception and awareness of this effusion of divine grace that wells up in one's own being, out of the mirror of one's own heart, through the influence of the manifestations of God. And this is what he's ordained as the knowledge of God. He says that the knowledge of God in no wise is no in no wise possible except through knowledge of the manifestation of God. So when he says we should know God, he explains that his meaning is that we should know the manifestation of the names and attributes of God. That constitutes knowing God and is more than we can bear anyway. So we're not going to feel like we've been cheated or something. Even the manifestations say that they know God as he is manifest in their own reality. Nothing in creation knows God as he is in his own reality. We understand God at the degree of human reality, illumined by this spirit. This is why each of us perceives him in a different way, too, because each of us are at different, both at different stages of development, on the one hand, and also we're endowed differently. If we receive the outpourings in different refractions, if you will, each with its own melody that's unique to each of us, to our lives. And therefore, our reflection of that effulgence or that effusion of divine grace is also unique so that it will represent the oneness and singularity of God in creation. And this is why we never can be bored with the rest of human beings because each human being can reveal to us facets and aspects of divinity that we couldn't see anywhere else, that we wouldn't witness anywhere else. And in the other realm also, this will become very important, the witnessing the beauty of God as reflected in the face of every human being. Again, to Mrs. Goodall, Abdu'l-Bahá wrote, There is a wonderful power and strength which belongs to the human spirit, but it must receive confirmation from the Holy Spirit. The rest of what you hear is superstition. Now she's also she's saying, what about these trumpet players and things? That... <laughs> but if it is aided by the bounty of the Holy Spirit, the human spirit, it will show great power. It will discover realities. It will be informed of the mysteries. Direct all the attention to the Holy Spirit. Call the attention of every soul to it. Then will you see wonderful signs. Again, for Holy Spirit, we can read Baha'u'llah. There were some answered questions. Speaking about the um, levels of education that man requires. Physical, mental, and spiritual education. He, in other words, the manifestation, must also impart spiritual education so that intelligence and comprehension may penetrate the metaphysical world and may receive benefit from the sanctifying breeze of the Holy Spirit and may enter into relationship with the Supreme Concourse. Again, this closeness and communion of souls devoted to God is hinted at in this passage. 
through the manifestations education, one can eventually enter into relationship with the Supreme Concourse. Page 9, some answer question. Don't ask me whose edition. I don't have it down here, but somewhere around there, British and American editions, you can compare. He says, the heavenly intellectual power, which is beyond nature, embraces things and is cognizant of things, knows them, understands them, is aware of mysteries, realities, and divine significations, and is the discoverer of the concealed verities of the kingdom. Now, this heavenly intellectual power, again, this is the divine one, all-encompassing. Abdul Baha says, a ray of this light falls upon the mirrors of the hearts of the righteous. And a portion and a share of this power comes to them through the holy manifestations. If the human spirit will rejoice and be attracted to the kingdom of God, if the inner sight becomes opened and the spiritual hearing strengthened and the spiritual feelings predominant, he will see the immortality of the spirit as clearly as he sees the sun and the glad tidings and signs of God will encompass him. It's also answered questions. It's answer question. In one of the Paris talks, if you turn the mirror of your spirits heavenwards, the heavenly constellations and the rays of the sun of reality will be reflected in your hearts, and the virtues of the king will be obtained. Therefore, let us keep this faculty rightly directed, turning it to the heavenly sun and not to earthly objects, so that we may discover the secrets of the kingdom and comprehend the allegories of the Bible and the mysteries of the Spirit. May we indeed become mirrors reflecting the heavenly realities, and may we become so pure as to reflect the stars of heaven. The more one reads these things, the more you realize that the apparently what may first strike us as flowery language of some of the prayers is most appropriately suited to all of these explanations. And gradually, excuse me, we come to see what the realities behind this, these symbols are. How else can we speak? We have no way to speak directly of spiritual realities. We have to clothe them in the images of this world. And this seems to be one of the purposes of coming into the world of creation is to acquire this repertoire of symbols whereby to figure and explain and understand divine purposes. Turn the mirror of the kingdom to the heavenly constellations. These are these lights of the spirit that shine in our inner reality, that are shining in our inner reality, that we need to focus our attention on. The mirror of the heart, Abdu Baha says, whatever it turns to, it will penetrate and it will become filled with that. If it turns to the world and worldly affairs, that will be filled it. And if it turns towards the heavenly light, that will fill it. It's a question of turning. The whole secret of man's free will is that he's been given the capacity, because of his free will, to turn voluntarily to God and away from other things. And I think we've mentioned before, the Bob says in one of his teachings that the only legitimate use of free will is that turning, is choosing God's will. In other words, we haven't been given free will so we can decide what we want to do and do, do anything else. The only reason we've been given it is so that through that choice we can choose to do what God wants us to do. Any other use of that power is illicit and improper. This world has an outer appearance. It has also a hidden aspect. These created things are linked one with the other into one system which leads to the unseen and ends at last in spiritual realities. I hope that these spiritual links will every day become stronger and this mind communication which is termed inspiration will continue. When this is realized, there is no cause for disturbance over bodily separation. This station is beyond the circle of words and above all description. Abdu'l-Bahá says, A man cannot comprehend spirit before he has put aside earthly things. Finally, he tells us to be self-sacrificing in the path of God and wing thy flight under the heavens of the love of the Abha beauty. One of the pilgrims who was here 
Mrs. Thornburg Cropper says that she heard she took down this note in Abdu'l-Bah's presence, that the heavenly kingdom was in us now, that if the spirit of the departed entered the most heavenly paradise without eyes to see its beauties and ears to hear the celestial music, they would hardly recognize where they were. And again, he's telling us, the kingdom is with us now. Do we see it or don't we? Our spiritual sight, our inward sight, our spiritual perception, our inward sight must be open so that we can see the signs and traces of God's Spirit in everything. Everything can reflect to us the light of the Spirit. This is cited in the New Era, page 100 of the U.S. edition. And that's the end of that section. Next week we'll be taking up Passage to the next life, the moment of death, how the soul is called to account for its actions, and something from what we can perceive from the quotes about the operation of God's mercy and God's justice.